As I said this morning, tonight I'm going to be preaching a sermon on Martin Luther King Jr. The holiday is coming up in one week, and uh, next weekend Martin Luther King Jr. will be celebrated all across America. And Martin Luther King Jr. is one of those people that everybody likes. If you talk to people out in the world, he's pretty much just universally accepted, universally lifted up by all types of people, politically, religiously. He's just one of those people that all men speak well of. Of course, the Bible said something about people that all men speak well of. He said, woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so they did unto the false prophets. And I'm going to expose to you tonight and show you the truth that Martin Luther King Jr. was not a great man. He was not a godly man. He was not a Baptist preacher as he pretended to be, but that rather he was a wicked, perverted, evil, false prophet. Don't get emotional tonight. Some people get emotional when you start talking about their sacred cow or when you start to talk about, you know, that person that is their hero. You need to have an open mind tonight and just listen to what the Word of God says, listen to what the facts have to say, and then you can decide for yourself. And I don't think there will be any question by the time that I'm done preaching that Martin Luther King Jr. was a wicked false prophet. Let me start out by reading a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. himself, one of his most famous quotes. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And let me say this, Martin Luther King Jr. will not be judged in this sermon by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. Because the Bible makes it clear that God has made all nations of the earth of one blood. There's no Jew or Gentile. There's no Scythian, barbarian. Look, we're all one in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. And there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. There's no difference between white and black, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. That is meaningless. That has nothing to do with who the man is. And let me tell you something. If you are going to say that this sermon is racist, because of the fact that I'm attacking Martin Luther King Jr., you are the racist tonight. Amen. Because you are the one that wants to judge him based on the color of his skin. I want to judge him on the content of his character. Amen. You're the racist. You say, well, I don't want to hit Then get out of here. Yes, sir. You don't belong here if you're going to come here with your racist ideology and not want to hear the truth from God's word. Amen. Let's hear what the Bible says. First of all, let me tell you this. Martin Luther King Jr. was a false prophet because he did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Martin Luther King Jr. was a false prophet because he masqueraded as a Baptist pastor, yet he denied the virgin birth of Christ. Now, let, let me just read for you from his own writings. Now, this is from a paper that he wrote called what experiences of Christians living in the early Christian century led to the Christian doctrines of the divine sonship of Jesus, the virgin birth, and the bodily resurrection? And this paper can be read in its entirety at stanford.edu because Stanford University has compiled the writings of Martin Luther King Jr. and put them on the internet for all men to read and see what he wrote. Of course, they think he's a great hero and they think that these papers are wonderful. But this paper, What Experiences of Christians Living in the Early Christian Century Led to the Christian Doctrines of the Divine Sonship of Jesus, the Virgin Birth, and the Bodily Resurrection. I've got news for you, Dr. King. No one's experiences led them to those doctrines. The Holy Ghost spake those doctrines in the Bible. Amen. That's where they came from. They didn't come from someone's experiences. But listen to some quotes from the paper. He says this about the virgin birth. First, we must admit that the evidence for the tenability of this doctrine is too shallow to convince any objective thinker. To begin with, the earliest written documents in the New Testament make no mention of the virgin birth. The effort to justify this doctrine on the grounds that it was predicted by the prophet Isaiah is immediately eliminated. For all New Testament scholars agree that the word virgin is not found in the Hebrew original, but only in the Greek text, which is a mistranslation of the Hebrew word for young woman. Moreover, the Gospel of Mark 
the most primitive and authentic of the four, gives not the slightest suggestion of the virgin birth. How then did this doctrine arise? Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying that Isaiah 7:14 doesn't say that a virgin shall conceive. It just says a young woman shall conceive and that Matthew got it wrong when he said a virgin shall conceive in the Greek New Testament. And he says, anybody should just, you know, all, and whenever anybody says this, you know, all scholars agree. It's probably false. Yeah. All scholars agree that it doesn't say Hebrew in the, oh, really? If all scholars agree that the Hebrew original does not say virgin, then why are there literally several hundred different English translations of the Bible on the market today that all say virgin in Isaiah 7:14? The King James says virgin, and even all these modern phony versions, they all say virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. Virtually every English Bible that has ever been printed says virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. Yet Martin Luther King Jr. says, well, all scholars agree that it shouldn't say virgin there. Then why did all these scholars put out all these Bibles that all say virgin? It doesn't even make any sense, my friend. But these are the words of the man himself. Now, if you don't believe in the virgin birth, that leads you to not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Right. And therefore, Martin Luther King Jr. states later on that he doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen to this quote from the paper. The church called Jesus divine because they had found God in him. They could only identify him with the highest and best in the universe. It was this great experience with the historical Jesus that led the early Christians to see him as the divine son of God. So in that quote, he's denying that Jesus is the son of God and he's denying that Jesus is divine, meaning he's denying that Jesus is God. Right. Now look down at your Bible at 1 John chapter 5. The Bible reads in 1 John 5, 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Wait a minute, a song just came in my head. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Isn't that what they sang? at Martin Luther King Jr.'s most famous speeches. Let me tell you something. Martin Luther King Jr. did not overcome according to Scripture because the Bible says right here in verse, uh, I mean, the Bible says right here, 1 John 5, 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, which is something that Martin Luther King Jr. did not have. Right. And then look at the next verse. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? No, we as Bible-believing Christians shall overcome. Amen. But Martin Luther King Jr. did not overcome right. because he did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Listen to what he said about the resurrection. At the age of 13, I shocked my Sunday school class by denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus. From the age of 13 on, doubts began to spring forth unrelentingly. Later on, much later when he's an adult, he said, the early Christians had lived with Jesus. They had been captivated by the magnetic power of his personality. This basic experience led to the faith that he could never die. And so in the pre-scientific thought pattern of the first century, this inner faith took outward form. So he's explaining that in their unscientific minds, they came up with the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he believed in science falsely so-called. Right. Now, what does the Bible say about the bodily resurrection? You don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He was talking about his body. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a bodily resurrection. Amen. Of course, we could go to many other scriptures that would show the same thing. He also taught that Christianity was just one of the many religions that came about at that time, and that it was heavily influenced by all the pagan religions around it. And he has a whole paper about how Christianity was influenced by the worship of Mithros or Mithraism. And he claims that Mithraism was a major contributor to Christianity. Okay. Listen to this from his paper. 
That Christianity did copy and borrow from Mithraism cannot be denied. But it was generally a natural and unconscious process rather than a deliberate plan of action. It was subject to the same influences from the environment as were the other cults. Now, if you read that quote carefully, you'll realize that he is calling Christianity a cult yeah. and saying that it borrowed from the other cults. So this man's a Baptist pastor. He was a pastor of two different Baptist churches. Then he was an assistant pastor at a Baptist church. Look, is this man a Baptist? No. It's funny. I was looking for an independent Baptist church in Norway. And I looked at the website of an independent Baptist church in Norway, and they wanted to explain what an independent Baptist is. And on their website, they said, famous Baptist pastors of the past have included great men such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Billy Graham. I mean, there's only one response to that. Just, <laughs> it's just are you insane? Oh, man. Wow. But this man was no Baptist. No. But think about what a wicked person pretends to be a Baptist pastor while openly denying that Jesus is the Son of God, openly denying the virgin birth, openly denying the resurrection, openly denying all these things. You say, well, then why be a pastor? He was only a pastor to further his political and activist ambitions. It had nothing to do with religion. It had nothing to do with being spiritual. It just had to do with giving him a platform and a soapbox to speak his message. Now, the Bible says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Then he says in Matthew 5, 11 through 12, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The Bible's real clear. The false prophets are praised and spoken well of by the unbelieving world. Right. And the true prophets are reviled and hated of this world and are an abomination to the wicked. But let me say to you next that false prophets are wicked people. Yeah. Yeah. We've established, have we not, that Martin Luther King Jr. is a false prophet. And in case you're confused, a false prophet is not someone who predicts something that doesn't come true. A lot of people misunderstand the terminology of the Bible. When the Bible talks about false prophets, it's talking about a preacher who preaches lies. And it's a preacher who doesn't believe the word of God, but he creeps in like an unbelieving Judas Iscariot. That's what the Bible defines as a false prophet. But someone's response to this could be, well, okay, so he didn't believe the right doctrines from the Bible. So what? He was still a great civil rights leader. He was still a great man and a great speaker. He still fought for a lot of great causes. That's what a lot of people would say. Who cares about his doctrine? We're not looking to him as a pastor. We're not looking to him as our spiritual leader. We're just looking to him as a champion of political issues. And so what he believed about Jesus is not the issue. Now, here's the thing. If he were just an unsaved guy who was a great political figure, I could see where someone was coming from with that. If he's just an unsaved guy, He's a non-Christian or just not a, a Christian leader whatsoever. This is a man who is a Baptist pastor. Right. That takes him from just being an unsaved dude to being a false prophet yeah. because he's in capacity as a prophet. Yeah. He is a preacher, okay? And what the Bible teaches about false prophets, and you haven't heard nothing yet. You buckle your seatbelt. Yeah. Let me tell you something. What the Bible says about false prophets all came true in the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And the Bible teaches very clearly that false prophets are rotten people to the core. Not just that they happen to have a few doctrines wrong, like the virgin birth and the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, but rather that false prophets are actually wicked people through and through. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible famously says, you turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, but the Bible famously says in Matthew 7:15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. That's how the Bible describes false prophets. A wolf in sheep's clothing. One who inwardly is a ravening wolf. Look what the Bible says about false prophets in 2 Peter chapter 2. 
But there were also, I'm sorry, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Jump down, if you would, to verse number 14. It says, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, an heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. The Bible says that not only are they denying Christ and preaching damnable heresies, but that they have eyes full of adultery, that they cannot cease from sin, that they beguile unstable souls, that they have covetous practices, and that they have uh, preached lies for the sake of filthy lucre. They've done it for wages, the Bible says, for money and personal aggrandizement. Go to Jude. Now, the book of Jude is a parallel passage with 2 Peter chapter 2. Jude covers the same material, but what you have to understand, 2 Peter chapter 2 is pretty much the false prophet chapter. You know how certain chapters in the Bible, like Hebrews 11, you'd call it the faith chapter. You know, or, you know, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 would be the, the, the love chapter on charity, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 would be the resurrection chapter. 2 Peter 2 is the false prophet chapter. I mean, it, it really covers that subject well. And Jude is a parallel passage with 2 Peter chapter 2. covers the same material. Look what the Bible says in verse 8. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. So these filthy dreamers, these false prophets who bring in heresy, the Bible says they also defile the flesh. And by the way, dreamer? Is there some familiarity with that? I'm having trouble. It's kind of ringing about. Oh, we'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> Verse number 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. But other than that, he's a great guy. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what people think? But this is about false prophets. Right. How could you say other than that he's a great guy? Well, just to remove all doubt, go to Jeremiah chapter 23 and see what the Bible says about false prophets back in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 23, verse 25. Jeremiah 23, 25. I've heard what the prophets said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Now, that sounds familiar. Yeah. I have a dream. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. But look at the key verse in verse 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. So is he saying, oh, society is going to profit from this guy, even though he's a false prophet, he's teaching lies, there are other good things we can get from him? No, it says that he shall not profit this people at all. That's what the Bible says, my friend. Now, what did the Bible specifically say about false prophets that they would do, sinfully speaking? Well, he said in Jude that they would defile the flesh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah being given over to fornication and so forth. He also said in 2 Peter 2 that they had eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Martin Luther King Jr. was a serial adulterer and a major pervert, which confirms what the Bible predicted he would be. Yeah. The Bible predicted that false prophets would be perverted and adulterous. That's exactly what Martin Luther King Jr. was. Now, the FBI has 14 filing cabinets full of eavesdropping data on Martin Luther King Jr. 
64,000 pages of this data was released to the Senate and it was labeled obscene. Not classified, but it was labeled obscene. Now this eavesdropping data uh, showed the fact that he would go to these cities where he would have these speeches. Basically every city where he spoke, he would hire all kinds of prostitutes and have orgies in his hotel room. A Baptist pastor, the wonderful moral civil rights leader, doctor, oh, I'm sorry, the reverend doctor, Martin Luther King Jr., was hiring prostitutes in city after city and having perverted orgies in the hotel room with these prostitutes. Now, uh, let me just give you the evidence. And let me tell you something. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is not on some right-wing website somewhere. This is not from some white supremacist or the KKK or one of these wicked organizations. No, these are facts that are openly acknowledged by all men. Let me give you some examples. This is from the Washington Post. An article in the Washington Post by Richard Cohen. Hmm, I wonder, I wonder, Cohen. I wonder what kind of name that is. But anyway, uh, this from the Washington Post by Richard Cohen. Let me just read for you this article entitled, What if the FBI had succeeded in exposing Martin Luther King Jr.? So he's, he's acknowledging the fact that the FBI had tried to expose Martin Luther King Jr. And the title of the article is, What if the FBI had succeeded in exposing Martin Luther King Jr.? Let me just begin to read the article to you. Beverly Gage, a Yale historian, was researching a biography of J. Edgar Hoover in the National Archives when she came across the infamous letter the FBI had written to Martin Luther King Jr., outlining in the crudest form his extramarital escapades and suggesting King concluded that he kill himself. There's only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. King did nothing but the FBI acted. It leaked its dirt to the press. So you're hearing what this article is saying. This is from the Washington Post. This article is from April 11th, 2014. And it says that the FBI sent a letter to Martin Luther King Jr. outlining in the crudest form his extramarital escapades and he concluded that the letter was telling him to kill himself and that if he did not kill himself that they would release that filth to the media so that everybody would find out about it. The article goes on. The year was 1964 and King was already becoming a heroic American figure. Later in the year, he would become the youngest person to win the Nobel Peace Prize. This is what the author says. I did not know at the time about King's affairs. I learned about them later. The FBI bugs of King's home and hotel rooms had become common knowledge in newsrooms around the country. But here's the thing. No one printed a word of it. I know of no item in a gossip column. And since celebrity TV junk was still in the future, nothing in the air either. Lots of people knew the secret, but the press in those days respected the privacy of public figures. King was saved from ignominy. He was preserved for greatness. Are you getting this? This article in the Washington Post is saying, isn't it so wonderful that when the FBI delivered all this smut that Martin Luther King Jr. was into to the media and said, hey, you need to expose this guy that everybody's looking up to as a great leader for the filthy pervert that he is, no one in the media would print a word of it. Now, it's not because they respected the personal lives. But no, you know what it was? They were receiving orders not to print it because the media is controlled because the media is not a free press. That's why, because they were being controlled and they were not allowed to print it. That's what's really going on. But this guy says he was saved from ignominy. No, he wasn't just because people don't know about it. God knows about it. And in 2014, everybody now knows about it. He was preserved for greatness. Not in my book. I don't think that a filthy pervert and a false prophet is a great man for one second. The article goes on to say, I can't help wondering what would have happened if King would have been exposed at the time. The cries of hypocrisy would have blighted the sun. A minister, a civil rights leader, a married man, a father. Yeah, those are good questions. 
Why is this man such a hypocrite? The result would be the hideous destruction of a great man. How can you destroy a great man just by shining the light on the fact that he is committing adultery with prostitutes in every place? And, and, and you know, I don't even want to go into it. It's too filthy to even discuss from the pulpit. The result would have been the hideous destruction of a great man and a moral rebuff of one of the greatest of all moral movements, the one that King himself led. A man of immense dignity. Really? Immense dignity? A man of immense dignity and incomparable bravery who embodied what is best about America would have been soiled. Look, that embodies what's best about America? Saying that Jesus is not the Son of God? Preaching that, uh, you know, that, that the Word of God is a lie? And, and just having one adulterous, filthy orgy after another. That's what's great about America today. According to this author in the Washington Post, it is. Now, I've got a copy of the letter right here. This is the letter that the FBI sent to Martin Luther King Jr. It's in the National Archive. It's been preserved for history. Now we can talk about it. You say, well, why did the media black out on it back then? But now the media openly talks about it. Because now the media knows that nobody cares. Because today our society is so wicked and adulterous, nobody even cares. And if you're sitting there thinking right now, well, I still like Martin Luther King. You know what? You need to check your heart because you obviously have the wrong priorities about what is important. Yeah. This guy's a wicked guy. Listen, to, I'm just going to read you part of it. Here are some excerpts from the actual letter that was confirmed on the floor of the Senate to have been sent. Because, you know, this article says... King was certain that the letter had come from the FBI. As soon as he got it, he assumed that it was from the FBI. A little more than a decade later, the Senate's Church Committee on Intelligence Overreach confirmed King's suspicion. So this was uh, a letter that King got in 1964, and in 19 excuse me, in 1974, it was confirmed that this letter came from the FBI. Let me just read for you some excerpts from the letter, but I've got the whole thing right here. In view of your low-grade, abnormal behavior, all right, let me start over, I read it wrong. In view of your low-grade, abnormal personal behavior, I will not dignify your name with either a mister or a reverend or a doctor, and your last name calls to mind only the type of king such as King Henry VIII and his countless acts of adultery and immoral conduct lower than that of a beast. Okay, this is what they sent him. No person can overcome facts, not even a fraud like yourself. Lend your sexually psychotic ear to the enclosure. You will find yourself in all your dirt, filth, evil and moronic talk exposed on the record for all time. I repeat, no person can argue successfully against facts. You are finished. You will find on the record for all time your filthy, dirty, evil companions, male and females, giving expression with you to your hideous abnormalities and some of them to pretend to be ministers of the gospel. I'm, this isn't me preaching. This is all directly from the letter that the FBI sent to Martin Luther King Jr. in 1964. Satan could not do more. What incredible evilness! It is all there on the record. Your sexual orgies. Listen to yourself, you filthy, abnormal animal. You're on the record. You have been on the record. All your adulterous acts. Your sexual orgies extending far into the past. This one is but a tiny sample. They sent him an audio recording with the letter. You will understand this. Yes, from your various evil playmates on the East Coast to others on the West Coast and outside the country. You're on the record. King, you are done. The American public, the church organizations that you've been helping, Protestant, Catholic, and Jews will know you for what you are, an evil, abnormal beast. So will others who have backed you. You're done. King, there's only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do it. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason. It has definite practical significance. You're done. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. 
I mean, this is what the FBI sent Martin Luther King Jr. There's a copy of it right here. This is from the New York Times. This was printed in the New York Times recently because now nobody cares because everybody's committing adultery, right? Well, no, not everybody. Some of us still believe in the Bible and Christianity. Come, come take a look at it after the service. It's right here. You think I embellish it. I did not add a single word to it. It's exactly what it says. So guess what happened? He didn't kill himself. So guess what they did? 34 days later, they gave it to the media. Guess what the media did? Total media blackout. No one would print it. No one would report it. Let me rephrase that. No one could print it. Well, I just don't think any of that's true. That's just a bunch of scuttlebutt. Right. Yeah, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the FBI, the Senate, they're all just creating this elaborate conspiracy theory. No, even his friends admitted it. Listen to this. Ralph David Abernathy, which is one of his fellow reverends that he ran with, he said in his 1989 autobiography and the walls come tumbling down that Martin Luther King engaged in extramarital affairs, evidence of which was sometimes recorded by the FBI through hotel room bugs. This is his buddy in the civil rights movement, Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Here's a quote from his book. I remember in particular a stay at the Willard Hotel in Washington, where they not only put in audio receivers, but video equipment as well. Then after collecting enough of this evidence to be useful, they began to distribute it to reporters, law officers, and other people in a position to hurt us. Finally, when no one would do Hoover's dirty work for him, someone in the FBI put together a tape of highly intimate moments. Yeah, that's one way of describing it. Highly intimate moments. And sent them to Martin. Unfortunately, and perhaps this was deliberate, his wife Coretta received the tape and played it first. But such, such accusations never seemed to touch her. She rose above all the petty attempts to damage their marriage by refusing to even entertain such thoughts. Right, that, you know, just those petty attempts, those petty attempts to hurt someone's marriage, like when you send them a cassette tape of their husband committing adultery with hundreds of different people in hotel rooms across America. You know, just little stuff like that that doesn't really matter anyway. She didn't let little stuff like that get her down. What a wonderful wife. Yeah. I mean, what in the world? Sometimes I feel like I'm living in the twilight zone. <laughs> now, you might ask yourself as I'm preaching this sermon, you might ask yourself, why was the FBI eavesdropping on Martin Luther King Jr.? And the answer is because of him being connected with communists. Yeah. That's why. It was because he was a communist. On October 10th, 1963, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy authorized the Federal Bureau of Investigation to begin wiretapping the telephones of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Kennedy believed that one of King's closest advisors was a top-level member of the American Communist Party and that King had repeatedly misled administration officials about his ongoing close ties with the man. Kennedy acted reluctantly and his order remained secret until May of 1968, just a few weeks after King's assassination. Now let's look at King's top advisors and those with whom he worked at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Now Martin Luther King Jr.'s organization that he operated out of was called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Is that a fitting name for it? I mean does this guy sound Christian? Let's look at some of his advisors. Okay civil rights activist Bayard Rustin served as King's main advisor and mentor in the late 1950s. He had joined the Young Communist League in 1936 and continued working the Communist Party USA until the early 1940s. Following directions from the Soviet Union, the Communist Party USA and its members were active in the civil rights movement for African Americans. Following Stalin's theory of nationalism, the Communist Party USA, or CPUSA, once favored the creation of a separate nation for blacks to be located in the south of the United States. However, after 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin ordered the CPSU, or CPUSA to abandon civil rights work and focus on getting the U.S. to enter World War II. So does everybody understand? 
this guy, Rustin, is a communist. He joins the Communist Youth League. He's working with the Communist Party USA. And they're getting orders directly from the Soviet Union telling them, you need to work for civil rights for African Americans in America. Now listen to me. I am not against black people up here. And let me tell you something. I believe that black people are every bit as good as white people. In fact, if you study DNA, as I have done over the past few months, you'll understand that all white people are part black and all black people are part white. Yeah. Amen. You can't escape it. Go look in my office, walk in my office door, and on the wall, I have a certificate from the DNA lab certifying that I am an African American today. <laughs> Take a good look at this African American. And let me tell you something, not only that, I have in my wallet here, I'm a card-carrying African-American. Let me tell you something. I have in my wallet a card from a DNA lab with a QR code on the back that can be scanned with a personal profile of my DNA. And you see that African continent shaded in? I am a card-carrying African-American. This has nothing to do with race. This isn't about, and here's the thing. We could, we could talk about, you know, what was good about the civil rights movement, what we don't like about the civil rights movement. We could talk about all those issues until we're blue in the face, but that's not the point. The point is that the, the work that this man did for the civil rights movement was not motivated by loving his fellow blacks, but rather it was motivated by personal aggrandizement, the love of money, and following orders from the communists. I mean, that's what the facts show. And so, again, this isn't anything saying, oh, yeah, we need to segregate people. No, the Bible says that, that God's house should be a house of prayer for all nations. It should not be segregated. All nationalities and all ethnicities should be together in the same church. And look, they in the early days were the ones trying to make a separate nation in the South for blacks and make it a Soviet satellite. Okay, that's what the, the, the evidence shows. Let me continue here with Rustin. So when Stalin, because remember, Stalin over in the USSR, the Soviet Union, is telling the Communist Party USA to agitate for African-American civil rights. Well, when 1941 rolls around and Hitler invades Russia, now all of a sudden he wanted to change the priority. So he tells the Communist Party USA, okay, stop worrying about civil rights now you need to start agitating for the United States to enter the war against Germany. That's our new priority. Well, this guy Rustin, when he hears that, you know, he's not into that. He was a Quaker, so he's not into warfare. So he says, you know, well, I'm done with the communists then because, you know, they're not going for civil rights anymore. So instead he starts working with the Socialist Party. Now let me just give you a little hint. The USSR stands for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. I mean, socialism is just another word for communism. It's just a code word or a front word for communism. When someone says they're a socialist, it's, this, it's just because communism sounds bad. Because communism brings up memories of the Gulag Archipelago and tens of millions of people being murdered and Mao Zedong and Pol Pot and Joseph Stalin and everything. So, oh, oh, oh we're socialists. So Rustin began working with members of the Socialist Party instead after that. Now Rustin, now remember, just to review, Bayard Rustin served as King's main advisor and mentor in the late 1950s. This guy who's a member of the Communist Party and doing all this on orders from Stalin, okay? Rustin was a homosexual who was arrested in Pasadena in 1953 for committing sodomy in a car with two other men, he pleaded guilty to the crime of sex perversion and served 60 days in jail as a punishment. Now those were the good old days when sodomy was a crime. Yeah. Yeah. In 1953, even in California, he was arrested for sodomy. And notice, he was an advisor and mentor, I'm sorry, he was the main advisor and mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. in the late 50s. When was he arrested and convicted of sodomy? In the early 50s. 
When is he the main advisor and mentor of Martin Luther King Jr.? In the late 50s. So Martin Luther King Jr. has with him this known former communist and homosexual as his main mentor and advisor in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Another of King's most trusted advisors at this time was a Jewish New York lawyer named Stanley Levison, who was a leader of the Communist Party USA in the 1950s. Yet another of King's advisors and director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was Jack O'Dell. During the 1950s, he was a member of the Communist Party USA. Both John F. Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy tried to persuade Martin Luther King to separate himself from the known communists in his organization, but he would not heed the warning, which led to October 10, 1963, Attorney General Robert Kennedy authorizing the FBI to begin eavesdropping and wiretapping on Martin Luther King Jr. Look, the FBI wasn't trying to hear all of that stuff that they were hearing. The FBI's motive in wiretapping him was to figure out what was going on with these communists in his organization and what his connection to the Communist Party was. And they got an earful. I mean, can you imagine being that guy? Uh, yep, your assignment again is to listen to Martin Luther King Jr.'s hotel room. Oh, man, good night. I mean, that guy's mind was corrupted and perverted. Good night. And look, this wasn't some right-wing conservative that said, let's wiretap Martin Luther King Jr. It was Robert Kennedy. The Kennedys were liberal. And even they said, we need to wiretap Martin Luther King Jr. because of this communist connection. But they ended up getting all this smut and filth of his wickedness and adulteries. Here's what a woman named Julia Brown, who was a communist in Cleveland for nine years, said. We were told to promote King, to unite Negroes and whites behind him, and to turn him into a sort of national hero. We were to look to King as the leader in this struggle, the communist said, because he was on our side. While in the party, I learned that King attended a communist training school, that several of his aides were communists, and that he received funds from communists and took directions from them. He was one of their biggest heroes. Look, it's a fact. He attended the Highlander Folk School, which was a communist training school. Yeah. These are facts. He was a communist. He was a pervert. He was an adulterer. He was a false prophet. But other than that, he was a great guy. <laughs> Think about that, man. It doesn't make any sense. So eventually, we all know how Martin Luther King Jr. met his end. He was assassinated. The assassination was supposedly carried out by a man named James Earl Ray. But James Earl Ray never received a jury trial. James Earl Ray was put in prison, and after nine months in stressful conditions in prison, he made a confession to the killing, which three days later he retracted and said, I shouldn't have made that confession. I didn't do it. And till the end of his life in, I believe, 1997, when he died of, uh, as a 70-year-old man. You know, he died as a 70-year-old man. He maintained, I did not kill Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote a whole book about it where he lays out all the events leading up to his arrest and that he did not kill Martin Luther King Jr., even Martin Luther King Jr.'s own family believes that he was not the killer. Martin Luther King Jr.'s son went and visited James Earl Ray in prison and walked away believing him that he was not the killer. You say, well, how did he not get a jury trial? Well, because he was pressured into making this confession by his state-appointed defense attorney. Those are always wonderful. The public defender. When you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you that works for them that's best buddies with the prosecutor? Yep. Okay, so his defense attorney told him this. If you go to trial, you're going to be convicted and you're going to be put to death. Because if he would have been convicted in court, he would have been put to death. So they pressured him and convinced him to plead guilty, confess to it, and then you won't get the death penalty. You'll get life in prison instead. So that's what he did. Three days later, he regretted it, regretted it for the rest of his life fought to try to get a jury trial. Then Martin Luther King Jr.'s own family fought 
to try to get him a jury trial. And they wanted him to get that jury trial. He never got the jury trial. And this kind of goes back to what I was preaching on Wednesday, 2 Samuel chapter 1, about how people sometimes commit, confess to a killing they didn't commit. Look, there's a perfect example in the Bible. We just went over it on Wednesday night. The guy who comes to David and said, I slew King Saul, and the Bible proves him to be a liar, and yet David says, put this man to death. And David was right. I mean, David could only go off of the information that he had. But you have to understand, just because a person confesses to doing something doesn't mean that they're really guilty. And so you say, well, why do you bring that up about James Earl Ray? Why is that relevant? Well, because of the fact that I believe that the reason that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated is because they wanted him to be a martyr that would go down in history with greatness. And if he would have been continue allowed, and if he would have been allowed to continue living, he would have ruined his own reputation because he's going around committing all this filth. And so they figure, we better take this guy out while he's at the top of his game before he gets busted with all the filth and before he does something really stupid that we can't cover for him anymore and we can't have a media blackout anymore. So I think they took him out in order to immortalize him. Now, there's a national holiday. The national holiday for Martin Luther King Jr. originated in 1983. In 1983... A national holiday was proclaimed in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Starting on October 8th, 1983, there were debates on the Senate floor about the King holiday. And let me just point out to you the word holiday means holy day. That's what holiday means. Do we need a holy day for Martin Luther King Jr.? I mean, does this man sound like he was a holy man? And in these debates, there were, of course, people who brought out all the smud and the filth and all the 64,000 pages that the Senate had received. And then the other side basically just said, well, how dare you run this smear campaign? Just want to just ignore the facts of all this filth and smut that was proven by hard evidence. And, of course, the King holiday came about. Why? Because of the fact that if you don't like Dr. King, you're a racist. And by the way, if you don't like Obama, you're also a racist. Right. I mean, that's what these people believe, don't they? People will just try to tell you, shut up about Martin Luther King Jr., you vicious racist. I do not have a racist bone in my body. Anyone who knows me can verify that. But yet you're called a racist for criticizing Obama, for criticizing Martin Luther King Jr. We're just judging people on the content of their character, folks. Right. Nothing to do with color. People who don't have any facts want to make it about color and play that race card. And they're, they're liars. But anyway, in 1986, one state rejected the King holiday. Arizona. <laughs> in 1986, Arizona rejected the King holiday. So Governor Bruce Babbitt issued Executive Order 86-5, making it a state holiday because he wanted to run for president. In order to run for president in the rest of the country, you got to support the King holiday. Well, then the next governor came in, Evan Meacham, and on January 12, 1987, the first thing he did when he got in office was rescind the executive order and get rid of the King holiday and civil rights activists immediately responded by calling on tourists and conventions to boycott Arizona. We need to tell people you can't come to Arizona until we pass a bill honoring Dr. King, said lawyer Chris Johns, a leader of a coalition pushing for a state King holiday. Then, of course, there was the public enemy rap by the time I get to Arizona, you know. So anyway, you know, there's a big controversy in Arizona about whether or not they were going to have this King holiday. And eventually, of course, it was pushed through, and we have it today. And on the 3rd January of every November, the 3rd January, good night. <laughs> on the 3rd Monday of every January now, we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Now, listen, I grew up in Christian school. And I went to a lot of different Christian schools, Baptist schools, and none of them ever gave us the day off for Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we never complained about it one time because our parents taught us 
that that holiday was something that we do not observe as Christians because he was a wicked, false prophet and an adulterer and a communist. And when I was growing up, Martin Luther King Jr. was known in my house as Marxist Lucifer King. That's how he was referred to in my house. Marxist because he was a communist. Lucifer because he was of the devil. The Bible says that Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of light. And in my childhood, I grew up going to Christian schools and Baptist schools, none of which observed the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. But today, even Baptists, even Christians have been so brainwashed by TV and media that they exalt this man whom they know nothing about just because everybody else is doing it. And the Bible says, they that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. Now you say, Pastor Anderson, what's the message of the sermon? What are we going to do next Monday? What's the celebration? You know who I'm going to celebrate next Monday? Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus is the real hero of racial equality that, that we ought to be celebrating. If you want to celebrate the third... Jan Good night. What, am I ever going to get this right? If you want to celebrate the third Monday in every January as a day of remembering someone who did the most to bring people together of all nations and ethnicities, you ought to be celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, other sheep have I, which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And when he said that, you know what he was referring to? He said, other sheep that are not of the Jews, sheep that are of the Gentiles, I'm going to bring them, and there's going to be one fold, and there's going to be one shepherd, and my house shall be a house of prayer to all nations. Amen. And let me tell you something, the place where red and yellow, black and white can come together and have unity and be brothers and sisters is in the local church. Amen. That's where we'll be united. Amen. That's where we can come together and realize that we're all of one blood. That's where we're taught that our brother and our sisters are red and yellow, black and white because we are God's children only if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ today in the local church. The Bible says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. And you can insert in there white nor black, Asian nor Hispanic. I mean, it's just saying nationality doesn't matter. He says there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. The Bible says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Amen. That's the answer tonight. Amen. We don't need Martin Luther King. You say, well, if we don't have Martin Luther King, you know, then basically all the blacks are going to go back into slavery and we're all going to be segregated and everything. We don't need Martin Luther King. You know what that movement should have done is lifted up Jesus as their leader. And they should have made these Bible verses their slogan and chanted these slogans and said, we shall overcome by believing that Jesus is the son of God. Amen. That's how we're going to overcome the race problem is when we realize that we're all related through Christ because we believe in Jesus. And you know what? I have a lot more in common and I have a lot more fellowship and I have a lot more affection for my brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what their nationality, than even my flesh and blood relatives that are not saved. I'm not going to stick together with the white people. You know, we white people need to stick together and we black people need to stick together and we Hispanics need to stick. No, no, no. I'm sticking together with God's people. Amen. 
That's where my loyalty is. My loyalty is to Jesus and to his children. And nationality means nothing. Do not be deceived, my friend. Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. He is all and in all. And Lord, help us to exalt the name of the Lord Jesus, Lord. Help us to hate those that hate you. And help us to exalt and praise those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Lord, help us not to be carried away in the world's, you know, uh, glee and, and rejoicing in this wicked person, Lord. Help us to abstain from honoring this man. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, let's sing one song before we go. All right, we broke the record tonight. How many do we have? 115. Wow, our old record was, what, 108? And now we have 115. And you know what that means? Ice cream after the service every time we break our record. So let's sing a song before we go. Brother Corbin, come lead us.